This episode contains discussion of drug use and abuse and gun violence and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Singer, songwriter, musician, artist, activist, legend, Beatle, John Lennon was all of these and more to many people. He was an inspiration to millions during his life and continues to be for many, many after his passing. Lennon's life was tragically cut short when he was only 40 years old. He was entering his apartment building around 10.50 p.m. one evening when he was shot from behind by a gunman. At 11.15, he was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Friends, family, and fans throughout the world mourned his passing. Well, this is like one of the big biggies. It is a biggie. But we do have some thank yous. Yes, we do. We do. We want to give a Hey Girl thanks to Mark for writing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Requested by uh, Sarah Granby, Anaya Janik, Anya. I'm not totally sure. Probably didn't say either of those, right? (laughs) And Mark again. Thank you. We appreciate you guys. Yes, thank you. I also think that I'm going to take this moment to just have a um, disclaimer. So I think that there are some households that they are, especially our age, range there are some households that they're like a beatles household right like you grew up Mm -hmm. listening to them um something like that we didn't necessarily come from a beatles household so we're not all that familiar with their entire discography yes that is true yeah i mean we listen to them on the oldie station and stuff like that or like we talked about it earlier like the ferris bueller uh infamous scene at the parade that kind of thing not like we don't like them we're just not well versed (laughs) yeah exactly but i guess you know we'll just jump right into it yeah yeah let's do it john winston lennon was born in october of 1940 to alfred and julia lennon he was given the name john after his grandfather and winston after winston churchill see that's where the name is the united kingdom yep i should have trusted i should have (laughs) trusted Alfred was a merchant seaman, uh, Navy, and he spent much of his time away from his family. He would send them paychecks home so they would have money to live on. And he did that all the time, regularly, without fail. But in February of 1944, just the checks just stopped. And at that point, Alfred was AWOL, absent without leave. Nobody knew where he was. Six months later, he popped right back out at the right moment like he was just like hey guys i'm back and he wanted to just sort of like step back into the family life and julia was like sorry dude i've moved on like nobody knew where you were and she was pregnant at the time julia had a sister mimi who was enamored with john she and her husband were unfortunately unable to have children of their own And she kind of wanted John for herself. So Mimi actually called social services on Julia because she had John sleeping in the bed with her and her boyfriend. Which, like... That's not crazy. Some kids sleep in the bed. Yeah, Yeah, like... Well, nowadays, don't they call that... It's like attach attachment parenting or something. I've, I've heard of... There's a term for this. Like, remember that show, Big Bang Theory? Sheldon's girlfriend or not girlfriend? I can't remember. Maya, my oh god, what is her? Oh, Maya yes, Balik yes, yes, yes. or whatever her. La- uh huh. She does. She preaches or not preaches, but she talks about that she does that with all of her kids. Hmm. I mean, yeah. So like, I don't know. It's never been reported that anything else was happening. Yeah. You know, like just that he was sleeping in the bed with them. But like, I don't. That know. That seems pretty harsh to call social service. Or, right. I don't know. It's that's what we know. But eventually, Julia agreed to let John go and live with Aunt Mimi and her husband, George, whose family owned and operated a dairy farm outside of Liverpool. So, whatever happened, she went through with it. In 1946, Alfred went to visit John, and Mimi let him take John uh, with him on what Alfred was describing as just a really small vacation. But he had a different plan. He was going to take John with him and move to New Zealand. Hmm. Julia finds out about this. She follows them to Blackpool, a seaside town in Lancashire, England. Lancashire, good job. Once there, 
I think, I hope, once there, they get in a pretty big argument, and this involves Alfred, Julia, and Julia's boyfriend. In the end, they decided Julia would take John back with her, and it would be almost 20 years before John spoke to Alfred again after that. After only a few weeks of living with Julia, she ends up sending him back to live with Aunt Mimi and Uncle George. Not totally sure why, but that's what happened. Mimi and George made sure that John had everything that he needed. They bought him volumes and volumes of short stories and books. George got John interested in like crossword puzzles to engage his mind. He gave him a mouth organ which we would know as the harmonica. Right, 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 right. Mimi played Elvis Presley records for him and bought him a banjo, which like, she kind of started it there, didn't she? But (laughs) we'll get into that. And throughout his life, he still saw his mother, Julia, regularly. In school, John was described as like a happy-go-lucky, good-humored, easygoing, lively lad, because that's what they say over there, lad. Oh, lad. But he also got into fights pretty often. He was not one to back down when he was pushed. Despite that, though, John was still viewed as more of a class clown. He could just kind of hold his own, you know? He even made a self-made magazine he published at school called The Daily Howl, in which he would draw comical cartoons. I love that. (laughs) It's so precious. Like, it's so cute. Uh, And creative. Like, he's incredibly creative. In 1956, Julia lent John the money to buy his first guitar on the condition that he keep it at her house. So, remember, Mimi loves John dearly. Right. But she she could not wrap her head around his fascination with music and her hope the whole time that he was really, really into music was he'll he'll get bored of it. He'll grow out of it. And John would say sometimes, you know, one day I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be a famous musician. And she was like, no, probably not. Like they just butted heads over that. They didn't like connect really over it. And she would say like, you know, guitars are all well and good, you know, but you're never going to make a living out of it, which like man famous last words kind of right thing. and of course you know they were close but they just she didn't understand that part of him in john's later school years his teacher said that there was a shift in his behavior he had quote too many wrong ambitions and his energy was misplaced they often said the work he did lacked effort and that it seemed like john just wasn't focused on anything and he was fine to just sort of drift along from thing to thing john's attitude towards school ended up creating a rift in his relationship with his aunt. It reminds me of the relationship between the mom and Lauren Hill's character. Oh, yes. Rita? Yeah. Yes. Like, just... You need to get your head about the clouds and into those books. Yeah. Yes. It's not going to put food on the table. Mm -mm. And then in July of 1958, Julia was struck by a car when she was walking home after visiting John at Mimi's house. She did not survive, and this deeply traumatized John. For the next two years, he drank heavily. He was getting into lots more fights. Others kind of described it as a blind rage. It didn't take anything to set him off. It's just whatever happened, he was, like, kind of ready to go. And Julia's death would also serve as fuel for his creativity throughout his career and his life. When it was time for his secondary education to come to an end, John bombed his O-level exams, which I guess is like your... I don't know, for us, SAT, right. ACT kind of thing. But he still was permitted to attend the Liverpool College of Art after some intervention by Aunt Mimi. In the school, his behavior, again, was not great. He was threatened with expulsion many times. Eventually, he was thrown out before he finished. And this is according to Cynthia Powell, who was a fellow student at the time and then would later become John's first wife. Do you ever just think about, like, some of these people being like, yeah, we kicked him out of school. He Like, I, he had no... I, he just wasn't, he wasn't going anywhere. Right. And then it's like, look where they went. Oh, the places <laughs> you will go. Right. Like, yeah, because it's just, I feel like school a lot of times punishes kids for being kids. 100%. Well, it's, I mean. Sit still. Don't talk. You know, like. Yeah. Especially for, and I don't know, I've never been to an art school, but you would think that they would be a little bit more lax about certain things rather than being like kicking him out all the time and (laughs) you know what I mean yeah I mean you just do you get so like the way that certain things are set up is like literally just stifles the creativity the yeah the like wonder and exploration and like why do we want to take that out of somebody like yeah like it talk about like crushing the spirit and like snuffing out the light you know what i mean and that's 
so important. Yeah. And also, like, yeah. what if it had worked and they had, like, broken him? Would he have gotten to where he is or was? Excuse me. I don't know. Right. It's crazy. You're yeah. absolutely right. I don't know. So when Lennon was 15, he formed a band, The Quarrymen, named after Quarry Bank High School. He, th- at that point, it was more folksy, blues, country style of music. And in the summer of 1957, they performed their first show. And then on July 6th, they performed their second show. And it was at this show that Lennon met a young man. And the history of music would be set on a course that would change it forever. John met a young Paul McCartney and quickly asked him to join the band. Paul would later say that one of his biggest hurdles or one of the biggest hurdles that they faced early on was, not surprisingly, Aunt Mimi. (laughs) She, yeah, yeah, she's got time to, (laughs) so she made it abundantly clear to them that she thought that they were lower class and would patronize them when they came to visit John. I think that's bad. That's mean. But uh, Paul's father didn't like John either. He feared that John would lead Paul astray because of his behavior, but he still let them come and practice in their home. It was during these rehearsals that John wrote the first song that he ever wrote, Hello Little Girl, which in 1963 would become a top 10 hit in the UK for the foremost in English pop band. Can you imagine your first ever song being a top 10 hit for someone else? Goodness. Yeah. I mean, unless you're Taylor Swift. Oh, my God. You can't shut up about Taylor Swift. It's like... Holy moly. But, like, she's writing songs when she's, like, f***ing 13, and, like, we're still singing them today. That's like, true. How, like, That is true. I don't know. Yeah. I've written some songs. Have you really? They've made the charts, not the top 10. <laughs> no top 10. Are you talking, like, maybe your uh, shower charts? Oh, those. We've hit number one. Yes. Like, come on. The Squeaky yeah. Clean Awards? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... If we could find my MySpace, you would see some of them because, of course, I posted. <laughs> of course you did. My Zanga could have had a lot of something. I wouldn't call them bangers, bops, smashes. <laughs> something happened yeah. on Zanga, though. Yeah. Paul immediately suggested that they also recruit one of his friends who was a 14-year-old George Harrison. And John was like, look, George is super duper young, but Paul set up an audition for George and he just like completely blew it out of the water. Again, how are you 14 and you blow? Anyway, I can't be happy for other people that do better than me in life, apparently. So, I mean, it's just incredible. I know. Incredible. Yeah. Like, and it's one of those things too, where it's like, Uh, The stars aligned in such a way that we got this, like, ridiculously amazing... I don't know. Yeah. He quickly joined the band as well as a friend that John had from art school, Stuart Sutcliffe. And the story goes that Sutcliffe and Lennon came up with the name The Beatles because they both had a love for Buddy Holly's band, The Crickets. I'm guessing it was like a rickety-crickety type of situation. So it was a small homage uh, to that band. And in early August of 1960, the year that they became The Beatles, they accepted a deal for a 40 eight night residency in Hamburg, Germany. They would go to the city, play various venues, and there was one small problem with this. At this time, they didn't have a permanent drummer, so they ended up recruiting Pete Best to play. When Aunt Mimi learned of this trip to Germany, she was like, please don't go. This is not going to benefit you. Singing does not food on the table. Singing does not pay the bills. But like, but it actually is paying the bills. They have a 48 show residency or 48 night residency. So that, unless it was free, which I don't think it was, like, it's by definition putting food on the table. Like, you know, but, and I know like, Especially at that time. I mean, I don't know. It's probably like now when parents are like, my kid wants to be a YouTuber or whatever. Like, <laughs> Right. Yes. Or wants to be an influencer or whatever. It's <laughs> like, that's not reality. But Well, I mean, not that we, be. not that we are like the picture of success for something like this, but we have had a success that I'm proud of for sure. And it's like, you know, not that dad ever was, Miss KB was never like, oh, you're never going to make it in this profession. But I'm sure people are like, you can't, you can't get, make money and make a living just talking. I'm like, hold my beer. Yes, you can. Because we did it. I mean, <laughs> thank God. What a, what a world. What a time to be alive. And thank you guys <laughs> for listening or watching. Um, yes. You guys are the reason that we were able to do this. But 
anyways. Aunt Mimi was like, "Mm -mm, I don't want you to go. But he went anyway. Uh, In Hamburg, their shows went great. And so great, in fact, that they were asked for a second residency in April of 1961 and then a third in April of 62. And this time in Germany is when the band really learned how to perform and work together. And it was also when they were introduced to Preluden. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. A stimulant that was originally designed as an appetite suppressant, and John used it regularly, especially the nights that they had shows, because they would go on for hours. Preludin was pulled from the market in the 80s because of widespread abuse by the general public. When it was time to return home from uh, Hamburg, Sutcliffe decided he was going to stay in Hamburg and left the band. Paul took over the bass guitar, and they decided to move on from Pete Best on drums. They ended up bringing in Ringo Starr and the lineup we know as the Beatles is now set. During this time, they also met Brian Epstein, who would later be, or who would become their manager until his death in 1967. Epstein's family were successful retailers in Liverpool. Liverpool. Sorry. (laughs) I will jump at the chance to do an accent, even though I suck at it. They... That's a good Liverpool. Okay. (laughs) Liverpool. They basically had a furniture store that they expanded by purchasing shops surrounding their own, and this expansion led to them selling musical instruments and household items, kind of reminiscent of like a Target or Walmart type of department store that we have, you know. They called their new business the North End Music Stores, or NEMS. 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 It's NEMS. Brian was made the director of NEMS after he was medically discharged from the Royal Army Service Corps, and Brian was also gay, which is something that he confessed to a psychiatrist who was a family, or a friend of the family. He wasn't just a family. The psychiatrist suggested to Brian's father that Brian should get out of Liverpool for a while, and Brian had been wanting to study acting, so he went to London and enrolled in the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and I love London, England. Oh, my God. Do you? Oh, I love London, England. Oh, crazy. Brian would drop out saying that he didn't like being a student at all and that he had become too much of a businessman to enjoy it. In 1957, he was arrested for soliciting sex from an undercover officer, and he was given two years probation. While he was on probation, he was assaulted by a sexual partner who also tried to extort him to keep quiet about his being gay. Brian reported it to the police, and the man was arrested. Brian, of course, we know how this goes, right? If you report it, then if you want them convicted, you have to testify in court which would affect, like, it, it would have outed him to his friends and family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The court, which okay. also, like, in this situation, we shouldn't ever have to be impressed by them actually taking it seriously, but, like, at that time. Right. Because in the 90s, like, oh. when you look at Jeffrey Dahmer, and the police mm-hmm. were like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, two men together? That's crazy. And that was the 90s. Yeah, that- Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just insane. So, I mean, at least they did do something. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it just what you can say about it. Right. And, I mean, we've talked about it until we're blue in the face, but it just sucks that you have to testify even though you should not. Or, I mean, recorded video could work and just show it to the jury. I don't know. I don't know, but it's just, Mm -hmm. it sucks. So, the court barred the press from giving Brian's identity, and the man who assaulted him served two years in jail. Brian returned to Liverpool, where his dad put him in charge of the record department for their newly opened NEMS music store. Everyone said that Brian always had an eye and ear for music and talent. This reminds me so much. I don't know if this is it's probably where they got the, the plot, I would think, but it reminds me of That Thing You Do. Yes. I think his name is Horace, their first manager, and then Tom Hanks mm-hmm. comes in, but it exactly reminds me of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me too. So it didn't take long for him to notice the hype that was starting to build around a group calling themselves the Beatles. Over time, Brian contacted Alan Williams, their previous manager, and asked if, you know, are you still involved with the band? And he was like, no, I'm not. But he told Brian, quote, not to touch them with a f-ing barge pole. Apparently, this was over a dispute over his percentage of their money from the Hamburg shows. And Epstein was like, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to call the Beatles real quick. So... He set up a meeting. They were supposed to meet at a NIMS music store, but they were late. Three of them were late because they had been drinking. Paul was late because he woke up late and he was getting a bath. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I I personally, if I'm that late, I would be like, skip the bath. But Paul didn't. Sure. Do. So Epstein no. was 
pretty upset. And he, George told him, quote, he may be late, but he'll be very clean. It was a short meeting that would be followed by more, and eventually they signed a five-year contract. And at this time, Pete Best was still in the band, but when he got ill, Ringo filled in and everyone in the band preferred his drum style and demeanor over Best. So Best was more of a loner, didn't really hang out with the other people, but Ringo was more willing to cut up. He was, he just wanted to have, just wanted to have fun with them. And Epstein told Best that they were essentially kicking him out, like go kick rocks, and a new contract was drawn up with Ringo replacing Best as the drummer. Before Epstein, the Beatles were not the band we know them as. They wore blue jeans and leather jackets. They would drink, smoke, and curse on stage. I can't even imagine <laughs> that, honestly. I cannot imagine that. Mm-hmm. Like, because they're, they were so put together Clean and so. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's just wild to I me. Know. I didn't know that. <laughs> they started and stopped songs at will. And if somebody called out a song, they would break into it randomly. I mean, so no wonder they were tired as hell. They would be like, well, we were only going to play 10 songs, but I guess we're going to play 75. Like, you can't be Garth Brooks every night and keep your... <laughs> right. <laughs> like, shit. I love that you used Garth Brooks as that reference, but yeah, exactly. So Epstein was like, guys, you got to wear a suit and tie on stage. You got to stop eating, eating, swearing, drinking, and smoking during the shows. Mm-hmm. And John was like, I don't really want to do that. But later, he said that he would wear a balloon if someone was going to pay him. So they started performing and recording, and John and Paul began writing together. They recorded their first album, Please Please Me, in under 10 hours. They kept recording and grinding. In 1963, Julie and Lennon was born while they were on tour, and at one show, which the Queen and other royalty attended, at one point, John joked that they wanted everyone in the cheap seats to clap their hands and quote the rest of you if you'll just rattle your your jewelry. (laughs) <laughs> in the uk the beatles were finding mainstream success and in 1964 they made the jump to the u.s and the ed sullivan show and this was when the beatles f- exploded to say that they were a huge is a complete understatement they kept touring performing making movies and experimenting with drugs and see that again makes me think of that thing you do except for the experimenting with drugs part but the captain geech and the shrimp shack shooters <laughs> right Hey, I wonder what happened to the old needers. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I gotta, I'm going to have to watch that after this. So <laughs> in a March interview, Lennon said his famous line about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus. I think that's bad. Mm-hmm. Which the UK didn't, it, it didn't cause a murmur in the UK. Like they, they didn't bother, or they didn't mind it. But in the US, people lost their f- minds over it. They burned Beatles albums. The KKK held rallies to speak out against the band. The KKK are hitmen with morals. Right? Like, I'm sorry, what? You have a... Pr- you Because because we around here in the KKK, we follow Jesus. Do you? Do you yeah. Have you read? Have you, have, you, have you read him at all? Anything? No. No. Okay. No. Like, it's just, you know, and people were threatening to kill him yeah. because of saying that. So, like, we've not, you know, been secretive about this. We're both of the Christian faith. Like, I go to church every Sunday. Like, whatever. I do not. If you, if you feel so upset that somebody has something like that to say, our band is more popular than Jesus, then you need to look at yourself. Right. Because let me tell you, these same men who are maybe not, you know, football at that time, but these same men who are now going to hold rallies about this, who are going to burn albums, who are going to threaten to kill people. Mm -hmm. What are you spending your time hyping up? What are you making popular? It's certainly not Jesus, because if it was, then Jesus would be like the Beatles. People would be, you know, there's you're not doing anything. Where, like, when you go to church, you're like, ah, my God! you know, like, I, I just don't, like... Fainting when you're at a church and stuff like that, yeah. Like, you don't have that level ex- of excitement about your faith, but you expect other people to. Like, so many people just kind of view it as like, oh, okay, I went to church, check the box, you know, whatever. Like, but then you hear something like this and now you're outraged about it when you yourself are obviously not doing the things that would show that it holds that place in your life. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, very good point. 
Hello, pot. This is the kennel. <laughs> exactly. It reminds me a lot of because Oasis when they came out and they got successful and then they said they were going to be bigger than the Beatles and everybody was like, yeah. So Oasis is canceled. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, <laughs> we don't talk about the Beatles, right? No, you can't like that. Compare yeah. yourself to the Beatles, but it's not. I don't think that they got as bad of a backlash as the Beatles did. But in 1966, they stopped touring. They focused on writing and recording. And they also focused on a little thing that we in the biz like to call drugs. In August of 67, Brian Epstein died from a drug overdose, unfortunately. While Epstein was alive, the group said that they or had a say in what they would do and wouldn't do. But after his death, they seemed to take more control of what they were doing. Paul organized their first project after Epstein's death, a TV movie, Magical Mystery Tour, which was a critical flop. I don't know if it was glitter flop. Oh, jeez. But it was a flop. The soundtrack was a huge success, though, featuring I Am the Walrus. So now we're going to go through the ins and outs. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> we're in fact not. If it was opposite day, we would be going through it, but we're not because it's too much, right? The years that they spent together left a mark on the world that still influences musicians and artists today. They have albums that are certified gold and platinum many times over. From 64 to 70, they released 17 studio albums in the U.S. That is insane to me. Did they ever sleep? Including Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, The Beatles, The White Album, Yellow Submarine, Abbey Road, and Let It Be. In 67, John started to insist upon having his girlfriend... Yoko Ono with him at all of their recordings. Talk about throwing a wrench in the spanner, man. Uh, a wrench in the spanner is a spanner in the works. A spanner is the same thing as a <laughs> wrench. Like, you know, throw a right? wrench inside of the wrench, that doesn't make any sense. But in 69, they were married and they formed a band together, Plastic Ono Band. John's insistence upon Yoko's involvement in their recording process, along with his major use of LSD and drugs, really drove a wedge in the band. He harbored resentments towards Paul as well, and John left the band in September of 69, but he agreed to not make any type of announcement because the group was renegotiating a record contract at the time. In April of 70, Paul released a solo album, which pretty much announced his departure from the band, and John was pissed. Basically, he was upset that Paul was getting credit for breaking up the band. He uh, said, quote, Jesus Christ, he gets all the credit for it. I started the band. I disbanded it. It's as simple as that. Okay. <laughs> he mine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Me. <laughs> yeah. He didn't do it. I did it. Yeah. But he said that he was a fool to not do what Paul did a, and use his leaving the band as a means to promote his solo album. John said that the perceived hostility that they felt from the other three members towards Yoko and the fact that he, George, and Ringo got tired of being sidemen for Paul led to the band breaking up. Quote, after Brian Epstein died, we collapsed. Paul took over and supposedly led us, but what is leading us when we went round in circles? After the band broke up, John saw success as a solo artist and activist. In 1971, he released his second solo album, Imagine, which would be certified two times platinum in the U.S., and George Harrison played guitar on some of the tracks, and as a thanks, John was like, okay, I'll perform at this benefit that George had set up in New York. George insisted, though, that Yoko not be involved in any of the shows, and John agreed to this. But then he and Yoko got in a big fat fight about it. Eventually, John pulled out of all the shows um, I... altogether. So I don't know much about Yoko Ono except for, like, what I think everybody has heard. Because I'm, you know, a peripheral fan of the Beatles. You know what I mean? Like, I, I appreciate yeah. the Beatles. I love what they did for music. I think that they are... I mean, I'm in awe of their music career and talent but like i said earlier like we didn't grow up with it so but i know enough about right. yoko ono to know that she was a big fat problem for the beatles but she must have been really fucking bad if even like george harrison you know if they were like look i don't Everybody. even want her there yeah yeah i know i and i don't know i don't know all the details about it either but there was apparently a pretty large influence there and i think just the way it seems is that they wanted John and not the influence that she had over him. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason why that situation is used as an example for a lot of other, you know what I mean? Like, they're like, oh, 
don't be a Yoko. Don't be a Yoko. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. She's still alive. She's in her 90s. Can you imagine, like, like if the thing was like, you know, don't be a Torella. <laughs> I mean, like, right? Because you hear it in, like, movies, TV shows, yes. like, everything. Yes. No, they reference it. Every time you hear it, you'd be like, don't pull a Torella. I know. That sucks. I know. Like, um, I don't know. Maybe she doesn't care. She seems like a, a woman who can hold her own. A one hundred percent. Yeah. I, but I would think that she would have gotten a lot of backlash just by. I mean, she's the reason the Beatles broke up. And can you imagine? As I'm sure, like people, they're diehard Beatles fans. You know, like I wonder if she yeah. got any death yeah. threats. That's crazy. I think she probably did. Sure she did. People are probably screaming at the like whatever they're listening to or watching right now being like don't you know this like <laughs> no <laughs> sorry i know sorry we just we weren't like huge beatles followers john ends up just pulling out of the shows and then george and john didn't really see each other much after this but george always said that he did have a special bond with john and he felt close with him going back to the time when they were you know just like the good old days just taking lsd together you know as young lads do <laughs> john and ringo had a much more laid-back relationship it was definitely the least complicated relationship among the band members they had mutual respect for one another and they just loved each other and they stayed really close up until john's death there's so many, like, it's it's these little complicated, I don't know. Um, well, I think that that, and that is true of any falling out. It's not, never this one big thing, or rarely is it ever yeah. this one big thing. Yeah. It's all of these things. Yeah, and, uh, you know, everybody's different. John and Paul's relationship was the most strained. Oh, yeah. It was speculated that John was jealous of Paul, which is probably true on some level. They would go back and forth at one another in the media on occasion, John actually called Paul's first album rubbish. Kind of not nice. They feuded back and forth. They would each release songs that the other suspected was about them. Uh, it reminds me very much of like Brand New and Taking Back Sunday. Like, you know. But they did eventually reconcile, which is nice. By 1974, John and Yoko had split and they had spent some time apart. So John was in L.A. with his girlfriend, May Pang, and they decided to pay McCartney a visit at his home. And so they spent the evening reminiscing about the good old days, and it seemed to really help, like, heal old wounds. And later that year, they actually almost ended up forming, like, a super group with David Bowie. They showed up to his hotel room one night, and they're just like, hey, man, like, you want to, like... You want to, like, do a band thing? It could be, like, a trio. We'll call it David Bowie and the Beatles. I want to do the accent. Um, like, hey, David Bowie, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and nothing came out of it. Around this time, disputes and legal issues between the band members were all coming to a close, which was helping to ease some of the tensions between them as well. In the media, they were each acknowledging the other's contributions to the band and the impact that their songwriting partnership had so you know we're we're it's getting a little better yeah. it's getting a little I think better time maturity <laughs> yes absolutely yeah I mean these are yeah young young lads you sure know? yeah in 1976 Paul was visiting John in New York and they were watching SNL Saturday Night Live when Lorne Michaels the show's co-creator and producer which like how old is Lorne Michaels started talking he's about them getting back together I think he's actually 135 years old I think he, I mean, like, come on. He mentioned that their problems were all personal issues and that the real issue was nobody had come up with an amount of money that would satisfy them. So he said, listen, I'm authorizing a check of $3,000 for you guys to reunite. It no was one can turn down that joke. money. Exactly. No, I was like, it was a joke. You know, it's on SNL. There's, you know, all these viewers watching this or whatever. And John's apartment wasn't far from the studio. And so they were like, what if we just like go up and like say, hey, we're here to claim our check or that whatever. That would be but wild. I know that would be, Lauren Michaels would probably be like, oh my God, like I did not know that was going to happen. But then they were like, nah, I'm kind of tired. So they just <laughs> stayed home. Um, that I but relate to that so A hundred percent. And later Paul kind of talked about these things. You know, he said, I was very glad how we got along in those last few years that I had some really good times with him before he was murdered. Luckily, our last meeting was very friendly. We talked about how to bake bread. And in John's last interview before his death, he talked about their relationship and he compared it kind of to a like a sibling rivalry. Makes sense. 
John also had two children, so Julian and Sean. Julian's mom was John's first wife, Cynthia, and then Yoko is Sean's mom. Julian and John's relationship was very strained at times. He really got along better with Paul. Which I can only imagine and when they would, would have create like strengthened that strain between John and Paul. Exactly. When they would visit, Paul always made time to hang around. He would play with Julian when he was a young boy. And on a car ride to visit Julian with John, Paul composed a song that was then titled Hey Jules about Julian, which was later changed to Hey Jude. So when John dated and later married Yoko, his and Julian's relationship suffered further. He hardly saw his father. When John and Yoko split up and then he dated May, May encouraged him to reach out and like rebuild his relationship with Julian. They connected again, and John encouraged his interests, especially when it came to music, of course. He showed him different chords and techniques to play more effectively. Like, can you imagine your dad being freaking John Lennon? Like, my gosh. Like, what better, you know? And Julian said that they, quote, got on a great deal better during this time. They had a lot of fun. They laughed a lot. They just had a good time together. I'm glad that they had, they were able to have that. Yeah, yeah. But even so, when John passed, Julian was completely left out of his will. I there, Well, there was a trust that had been set up with 100,000 pounds in it for him. Yeah. But he later sued his father's estate in 1996 and reached a settlement authorized by Yoko, reportedly worth up to 20 million pounds. So big, fat difference. Yeah, definitely. There. I do wonder, though, like, I mean, I can't know the ins and outs of that, obviously, but... I wonder if it was like one of those things where you, you you do your will and then you make up with whoever and the first thought on your mind is not going to be like, I need to update that will. And of course, he didn't think that he was going to get murdered. So, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't know how much Yoko influenced, influenced that or said yes or no or you know, I don't know, because it definitely seemed like, and again, I feel like people are probably screaming like, of course I did or, you know, like, <laughs> right. I don't know. But you've got John having strained relationships with everybody in his life. Mm-hmm. When he's with Yoko, for sure. When he's with Yoko. And then they split up for a little bit. He gets his other girlfriend and he's able to repair a relationship with his child. Mm-hmm. And she encouraged it. And then they it. get back together. and it, Yeah, and she encouraged it. And then they get back together, and that Here we essentially go yeah. seems to go away. Like, Yoko is the problem. So, yeah. I mean, you don't become a verb, like, you know, <laughs> right. like, for nothing. Yeah. Sean was born in 1975, and by this time, John wasn't really recording or involved as heavily in the industry at all. So he was able to spend more time with Sean than he was with Julian, of course. He commissioned a photographer. To take a picture of Sean every day for a year and then drew different drawings for him frequently. It's got to be hard for John. Oh, uh, yeah, 100%. Figure, like, probably. Uh, and also probably hard for Sean, too, because he's like, I want to get into everything because I'm a tiny little baby. And everybody is like, sit still because we got to do your picture for today and oh. then I have to do your portrait <laughs> yeah. for today. And it's like now they're watching everything he's doing and he's like, can I not just like be take all this stuff out? And yeah. yeah. Like, hey, dad, why don't you take a note from your song and let it be? <laughs> see what I did yeah. there? Like, you see. I got things to do here. <laughs> After John's death, these were published as Real Love, the drawings of, for Sean, not of Sean, sorry. Of Sean. John said, okay, John and Sean is a lot in one sentence. I'm having a hard Sean time. Sean and John. Uh, Sean. John said, he didn't come out of my belly, but by God, I made his bones because I've attended to every meal and to how he sleeps and to the fact that he swims like a fish. So, yeah, I mean, they had a strong bond. That's sweet. And, of course, we're not saying that John Lennon was a perfect human being. Of course, he was far from it. Like all of us, he was flawed. And he struggled with that fact. And, I mean, so is everybody, you yeah. know? And it's just, it's so sad because it just seemed like he was starting to come around with some of the relationships that had been more difficult with some of the things that he had struggled with. And it was like, things are finally now. I don't know because again, he was like back with Yoko. So like, I don't know, but um, also, but like Sean was fine. I know. I also do wonder too, because with Yoko, I would imagine if I know Yoko the way that I think I do, 
of course, it sounds like she wasn't like, hey, you need to go spend time with Julian. But when they had Sean, I'm sure she was like, you're spending you're spending time with Sean. Mm hmm. So, yeah. 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 I read that the last thing that he said to Yoko before he died was because I guess they were out. Obviously, they had come back. But that the last thing he said before he died was, no, let's just go on home. I want to see Sean before he goes to Right. Bed. And I don't, I, I'm i not doubting that he wanted to spend time with Sean, but I think that mm-hmm. the influence no, no, of yeah. her over him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a different relationship. And I'm sure that for Julian, that's just Stings, very difficult. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's just a lot. But, um, and also just, you know, hopefully Sean can hold on to that. And Absolutely. Yeah. All of it's sad. It is very sad. By December of 80, John and Yoko had gotten back together. They were making music with one another. And around 5 p.m., they left their apartment at the Dakota. And this is basically a large apartment building, but we're talking like Upper East Side luxury apartments. Over the years, the Dakota has been home to many celebrities from Joe Namath. Never heard of her. Just kidding. uh, New York Jets quarterback. (laughs) To Rosie O'Donnell, to Judy Garland, and so John and Yoko, they leave, and while, like, as they left, John is signing autographs, which was not uncommon. God bless him. They would typically run into fans waiting outside hoping to catch a glimpse of John, and they went to the record plant, and this is a famed recording studio that started in New York, but is now in LA. A little before- I just, I just feel like, I'm sorry, but like, I understand that being a celebrity means that you're going to be in the public eye, and that people are going to ask for your autograph and stuff like that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But to camp outside of somebody's home- Creepy. It's creepy. It's dangerous. Like, well, obviously, it's just, we're talking about yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's just, it's just not safe for the masses to know where you live if you're that famous. No. It's just not. And also, I do feel like, I mean, okay, I have had some really, really intense loves for certain people, musicians, bands, whatever. But I have mm-hmm. never, ever, ever been compelled to be like, well, I'm going to find out where they live and I'm going to go and I'm going to sleep outside and just wait for them to come out. Like, because we live in, we live outside of Nashville. I've seen celebrities. Mm-hmm. They walk around all the time. We, uh, as a city, are known for like leaving them the hell alone. That's why they move here. But mm-hmm. I've definitely been like, oh, my God, there's Miley Cyrus. Oh, my God, there's mm-hmm. so-and-so. So, but again, it's like, I just, I I, do, I love Brendan Fraser. I have a tattoo of him, which is, some might say, I got a few screws loose because of it. But I love him so much. But I still am not going to be like, well, where the hell does he live? And I'm just going to go and be, get on the news about it. No, and especially now with the internet. I mean, you can find people's property records online and like that shit's creepy it is creepy yes definitely i just feel like that shouldn't be allowed i don't know i agree i completely agree a little before 11 p.m they returned to the dakota they exited their limousine and they headed into the arch entryway of the building and as they walked shots rang out john was shot twice in the back and twice in the shoulder another bullet missed and struck a window of the dakota John struggled bleeding profusely from the wounds and from his mouth up the steps into the building and said, I'm shot, I'm shot, before collapsing on the floor. The doorman rushed towards the assailant and shook the revolver loose from his grasp and kicked it away. A concierge rushed to try to render aid, but upon ripping Lennon's shirt to see the wounds, he quickly realized that there was little that he could do. The doorman shouted, quote, do you know what you just did? And the the assailant replied, I just shot John Lennon. Yeah, you did. The first officers arrived in about two uh, in two minutes after the shooting. They were like on it. They immediately arrested the shooter and put him in a squad car. The man apologized to them for ruining their night. Then one of them remembers responding, you've got to be kidding me. You're worried about our night. Do you know what you just did to your life? They read him his rights multiple times. More officers arrived shortly, and they quickly decided that his condition was too grave to wait for an ambulance, so they loaded John into a police cruiser, and they rushed him to Roosevelt Hospital. Another cruiser followed with Yoko. They said that on that drive, John was able to moan and acknowledge when they asked him questions, but he could only make a gurgling sound when he tried to speak. Then he lost consciousness. At the hospital, one of the officers put John on his back and carried him to a gurney yelling for a doctor for multiple gunshot wounds. They worked on John, but were unable to resuscitate him. 
They cracked his chest to try to save him, but discovered that one of the bullets had damaged the vessels around his heart to such an extent that there was nothing they would be able to do. Three of the bullets completely passed through his back and then out of his chest, and the fourth lodged in his aorta. Lennon was pronounced dead at 11.15 p.m. The cause of death on his death certificate was hypovolemic shock caused by the loss of more than 80% of his blood volume due to the gunshots. His autopsy report stated that even with immediate attention and care, no one would have survived for more than a few minutes with the wounds he sustained. Yoko Ono asked for the hospital to not make any type of announcement before she was able to get home and tell Sean. She said that he was probably watching TV and she didn't want him to learn about his father's death from a TV announcement. But she didn't know that there was a producer for ABC in the emergency room getting treatment from a motorcycle accident. This pisses me the f- right off. He, so much. He had overheard officers talking and called the station. And at the time, ABC was airing a Monday Night Football. And the ABC News president, Rune Arledge, encouraged the announcers to make the announcement. This encouraged, or this occurred as the game was winding down. Frank Gifford and Howard Cassell were the announcers and referring to the game Gifford said I don't care what's on the line Howard you have to say what we both what we know in the booth and that's when Howard made his now infamous announcement to the world yes we have to say it remember this is just a football game no matter who wins or loses an unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City John Lennon outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City the most famous perhaps of all the Beatles shot twice in the back rushed to Roosevelt Hospital dead on arrival hard to go back to the game after that news flash Howard was very torn about being told to make the announcement he and John were friendly and Howard had interviewed him twice before he would spend years thinking about making that call of whether or not it was the right thing to do Friends, family, and the world mourned John's passing. Yoko released a statement saying that there would be no funeral. John was cremated and his ashes scattered in Central Park in sight of the Dakota. The Strawberry Fields Memorial would later be created there. Okay, so we have not talked about Mark David Chapman up until this point because we really wanted to focus on John and his life. Mark David Chapman had no prior arrests, no trouble with the law. He was a fan of the Beatles. He also loved Catcher in the Rye and tried to model his life after the book's protagonist, Holden Caulfield, particularly his rage against hypocrites and phonies. You know what this reminds me of? The Good Girl. With Jennifer Aniston and Jake Gyllenhaal, and he calls himself Holden, which is not his real name. But because he is obsessed with Catcher in the Rye, and he wants to be like Holden oh, Caulfield. Oh, yeah. Do you remember this? I forgot about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I've never liked Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, my. Never? I didn't really love that movie. No, I no. didn't really... I like him in Bubble Boy, but that's about it. I didn't particularly love that movie, but it's... I I watched it once, so I memorized it, and I remember that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Chapman would claim that he was enraged at Lennon over his remark of the Beatles being more popular than Jesus. Why? Um, oh my God! Like, obviously that was I. I it's it might be true. I don't know, but it seems like it was just a facetious, like throwaway comment. Like, I don't think it was supposed to be as serious as everybody was taking it as. And obviously, he very clearly did not, should not have had to die for making that comment. If that's even true, absolutely not. But. And also, the most important thing in Mark David Chapman's life was the fucking catcher in the rye. What do you? Why are you so upset about that? Right. Like. That's not so important to you that none of what we talk about is going to talk about how involved in his religion he was. No. There's there's nothing about that. Exactly. So why is that, like, burning your bucket so much? I just don't get it. He said that also his song lyrics were in contrast to his lavish lifestyle, which made him a phony and a hypocrite and all the things. And Chapman was one of the people. Chapman. I know. That John actually signed an autograph for when he was headed to the recording studio that night. Keep going, because we're about to, you're going to see my blood start to boil. So later, Chapman said of that interaction with John Lennon, quote, He was very kind to me, ironically very kind, and was very patient with me. The limousine was waiting, and he took his time with me. He got the pen going, and he signed my album. He asked me if I needed anything else, and I said no. No, sir. And he walked away. Very cordial and decent man. He had this interaction with him before, prior to the shooting, obviously. And then he went ahead and f***ing did it anyway. Hours later. Like, he waited. 
yeah, he had plenty of time to be like, uh, you know what? Wow. I actually, Maybe I actually like genuine. him. Yeah. Yeah. And also, even if he's not genuine, too fucking bad. Like, you don't get I to just, be the one to be like, that's not fair. I, this is so the movie seven where, hmm. do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. John Doe is, I don't know if that's his actual name, but that's what they call him in the whole movie. Kevin Spacey. But he's, like, just becoming the judge and jury right? for everybody being like, you don't deserve to live because you live this way. Exactly. Well, f- you. Yeah. That's not your right. No, exactly. And there was actually a fan there who was an amateur photographer, and there is a picture of this interaction of John signing for Chapman. Like, there's a photo of this, and then hours later... He kills him. Chapman purchased the five-shot 38 caliber revolver in October, just a few months before he murdered John Lennon. He had been hanging in front of the Dakota pretty much all day that day. He had run-ins with the Lennon's nanny when she was walking with Sean earlier in the day. And see, that's another thing that pisses me off. You, nobody needs to be hanging around where somebody's child is coming in and out. Like, that is none of your business, not your right. You don't need to be around people's kids, especially people who you are so obsessed with that you will then go kill them. Who's to say he wasn't going to, you know, like Do it's something just, to Sean, right? Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, maybe this is neither here nor there, but he knows, he sees Sean and he knows what, what that's going to do. What he's about to do to his dad. Yeah. Yes. This is a five-year-old child. Yeah. James Taylor, you may have heard of him. I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, he I've lived in an apartment. And I've seen rain. I really that don't one. care much for James Taylor, to be honest with he's you. He's not my favorite. No, sure, he's a nice guy, but just not sure, my yeah. favorite music. He lived in an apartment across the road from the Dakota, and he was on the phone at the time and remembers hearing the shots being fired, and he's talking on the phone, looking out his window. And he and a friend in California were just talking about, like, the state of the world, and he said that he assumed hearing the shots that, like, the police had just killed somebody. Um on the street beneath his apartment. Uh, He just kind of thought it was a police shooting. So he and his friend hung up. And then like 20 minutes later, the friend calls back and says, yo, dude, that was John Lennon that was just killed. Like it wasn't a police shooting. And apparently Chapman had an interaction with James Taylor in the subway earlier that day as well or on this trip. So Chapman was charged with second degree murder, which they could have. I don't understand that. Like they could have very easily gotten a first degree murder charge and conviction 100 percent. like he had been planning this for super duper long time but i mean he let's take out that he bought the gun months before he had been planning it since eight o'clock that morning at least Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah well and then he also told the police that he used hollow point bullets to quote ensure Lennon's death he wanted to be sure this man would not walk away from this so Obviously, he planned this up to he he went out of his way to get bullets that would have 100 percent killed him. Caused the most damage. Yeah. yeah. This f-ing guy and second degree murder. OK. Yeah. In the six months before his trial, he saw over a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists. The ones for the defense said he was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was manic depressive. The experts from the prosecution side said he's delusional, but they do fall just short of psychosis. And then they diagnosed him with various personality disorders. Court appointed experts agreed with the prosecution. One said that Chapman himself didn't want to be considered crazy. And the defense experts only said he was because they were hired to do so. There was also some very like... Not ethical stuff on the defense psychiatrist part. So I watched the, I think his name is Dr. Todd Grande. Mm, okay. Um, he's a, I don't know if he's a psychologist, psychiatrist. He's a, he's a doctor, Dr. Todd Grande. And he does, people will ask him to like analyze the case of blah, blah, blah. So they wanted. That's really popular on YouTube. Opinion on, yeah, on this case of specifically Mark David Chapman. And he said that the defense team psychiatrist one of them would bring in suitcases of copies of the catcher in the rye for him to sign so they could wow cool i hope you're i hope you're happy with yourself and also (laughs) right side note uh, we're talking about this though 
I don't understand why people think that it's such a a bonus or like a get out of jail free card if you plead insanity and you actually get it because the thing is if you have a mental illness that causes you to to do something like this either untreated or treated I don't know that means that you are not fit to be in the general population because you are dangerous right yeah so either way so then he'd go yeah to a mental yeah facility right rather yeah his defense initially entered that plea not guilty for reason of insanity but then a few months later he decided to change his plea and his lawyers did not advise this they wanted him to keep it but he said that god had told him to plead guilty his lawyer told the court like i don't think that this is right i am opposing this i think that he needs to have further assessment into Chapman's mental state. Uh, The judge was like, nah, I'll just accept that. He decided that Chapman was competent to make that decision, all of those things that he, you know, could stand trial if needed and all that kind of stuff. The sentencing took place in August of 1981 and Chapman was given a chance to speak and uh, he read a passage from Catcher in the Rye. Get a hobby, dude, other than Catcher in the Rye. Tone deaf. Yeah, Yeah. tone deaf as Right. The judge sentenced him to 20 years to life and ordered psychiatric treatment while he was imprisoned. Um, As you can imagine, Chapman is kept under lock and key for his own safety. He's not really allowed to be in the general population out of fear of reprisals from other inmates. Chapman has applied for and been denied parole several times. His 13th parole hearing is scheduled in 2024. And it just does not seem like he's ever going to go anywhere. I mean, if like one of the things that Dr. Grande said is like, look, the parole board seems like they've just given up. They just give a different reason every time. They're like, no, and here's why. No, and here's why. No, and here's why. And he's like, they just, they're just not going to let him out. And he's like, but if you can have such a positive interaction with somebody that you have planned to kill for a long time because of these negative things that you've decided about them, and then you meet them and you find out that none of those things are true. Right. And you have such a positive interaction, you can talk so positively about that person, but you still go forward with killing them. 100%. In cold blood. And he's like, it would not be right if he had killed somebody who had done something wrong to him. Sure. Of course. But you could understand it. Like, with this, there is damn near no motive. Mm-mm. Just something that he's put in his brain. Obsessed over. And decided <laughs> that it's worth him being killed over. Sure. And then to meet him and, and him to have proven that false. And then that belief false. And then he's like, well, it. but, I mean, I'm already here, so. You know, it's just, you know... It, Dr. Grande thinks, too, like, this man is a danger to society. He he does have delusions. You just don't know what's going to happen. So he's right where he needs to be. But his next parole hearing is going to be this year. I anticipate nothing will change. But John Lennon and the Beatles are often credited by many as an influence and inspiration. John has been the subject of numerous memorials and tributes throughout the years. Countless parks and statues have been made in his name. Remember, the airport in Liverpool is renamed to the Liverpool John Lennon Airport. Wowzers. The Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership is often regarded as one of the most successful and influential of the 20th century. John was posthumously inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1987 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994. And I agree with all of that. I think that, I mean... I don't think if you like the Beatles or you don't like the Beatles, if you're familiar with them or you're not familiar with them as much, I don't think that anybody could deny that they deserve to yeah, all of them deserve no, all of the accolades that they have gotten. Yeah, there's no denying that they literally changed musical history. Absolutely. Like, well, and absolutely. random fact, my dog is named Apple after their rooftop concert, I'm guessing. I think that's what I heard. The guy that I got him from, he actually did this little teeny tattoo. It's on the side of my hand and it's a little paper airplane. But he worked at the tattoo place that I used to go all of the time. And his dog had puppies. His dog's name was Penny Lane. And then he got uh, the puppies he named. And I can't remember all the names, but there was Dizzy Lizzie, Lucy Diamond. I cannot remember. Maybe Jude. I don't know. But then Apple. Mm-hmm. And so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Apple is such a cute little name. I I was like, same. Yeah. And then you're like, I don't know anything about the Beatles. Really don't. Really don't. But I have watched the movie Across the Universe. I really liked it. 
and I love like all the covers of the Beatles songs. I love, I, I there's like, there's something about the songs that, you know, are great. And no matter who does them, I think that they really mm -hmm. yeah. hold up and are good. They're just good. Yeah, for sure. That's it. What a sad and just freaking un... Senseless. <laughs> yes. Just like, you know what? I think I'll kill John Lennon today. Like what? I know. That man did nothing to you. I know. And I'm I'm guessing the only reason is for the notoriety, right? Like everybody is going to remember you because you did this awful, horrible thing to this major. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's another person. reason why. I mean, obviously, we have to mention him because he is the killer. But we wanted to focus so much more. And any time that we can focus more on the victim, we want to do that. In this case, there's obviously a lot more information available about somebody as famous as John Lennon. There are some victims that there's literally nothing known about them. You know, there's, there's just not a lot sure. publicized. Well, yeah. and that could be for a multitude of reasons because maybe the family doesn't want. Um, yeah, it yeah. might be a private family and yeah, stuff like that. So we definitely wanted to, you know, we gave the necessary information about him, but we're not going to glorify or romanticize or. I don't even know the right word, but we're not going to glorify Chapman. That's for damn sure. No, so absolutely not. So there you have it, guys. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. If you're watching or listening, we love you and we will catch you next episode. Bye. Bye.